You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Hello, folks. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. And our topic today is a modern church history of toxic masculinity. And our guest is Kristen Kobes Dume. Yeah, she is the professor of history at Calvin University and has written a book called Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And it was a doozy. Yeah, and this is an important book. And you know what? We're going to get right into the episode here, but if you're interested, a deeper dive, you know, where you have this afterward, we're going to talk about some of the things that, you know, we came away with uh, from reading the book and from talking with Kristen. Right. Again, we often have things that we want to go further with, but don't have the time in the context of this podcast. So, if you want to hear more, we do afterwards from every episode that we have a guest on where Pete and I talk about this. You can just go to patreon.com front slash the Bible for normal people to learn more. So much of the inspiration for ideals of Christian manhood were drawn from popular culture, not from deep biblical exegesis. The fear was real in the hearts of followers, but it was actively stoked by religious leaders, by evangelical men in almost every case to consolidate their own power. Kristen, welcome to our podcast. It's great to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so you've written about a really not at all controversial topic, (laughs) which is really, I mean, I'm not making light of it because it's really quite serious, but I guess white men and evangelicalism and sort of the, the patterns of behavior that we've maybe seen over the last... I'm going to say, is it right, is it maybe 70 years or mm-hmm. is it longer than that even? A, a, but a good long time this has been brewing and some of it is just rising to the surface now. So, which leads to the question, you know, what what led you to be interested in researching, you know, really the modern history of patriarchy and, and toxic masculinity in the American church? Yeah, so this goes back many years, more than 15 years actually, the idea for this project I was a new faculty member at Calvin University at the time, and I was teaching a U.S. survey course, and uh, I wanted to introduce my students to the idea of gender in history, and particularly masculinity, how ideas of masculinity change over time, how they're linked to broader currents like economic shifts and religion and race and foreign policy and the like. So I, I planned this little lecture around Teddy Roosevelt. And I showed my students how his particular idea of rugged masculinity was was a product of his own times and how it was linked to American empire and American power. At the end of that class, a couple of guys came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there is this book that you have to read. And that book was John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. Uh. So I took their advice. I went down to Family Christian Bookstore and bought myself a copy I had heard of it. Everybody was reading it at the time. This was back in 2005, 2006. The book had come out in 2001. It went on to sell more than 4 million copies. (laughs) And Mm. so I opened the book up and I saw immediately what they were talking about because Eldridge opens his book with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. And then he goes on to sketch this really um, militant, militaristic conception of what he calls Christian manhood. So, God is a warrior God, and men are made in His image. Every man has a battle to fight. And this struck me as um, not um, particularly biblical and puzzling. And at the same time, uh, this was again 2005, 2006, it was the, the early years of the Iraq War. And I was seeing all this survey data about how white evangelicals were far and away more likely than other Americans to support the Iraq War, preemptive war in general, condone the use of torture, embrace aggressive foreign policy. And I just asked the question, what might one of these things have to do with the other? So, I explored Mm -hmm. this for about a year, did some research, and then ended up setting the project aside for various reasons. One, it was incredibly disturbing what I was uncovering, um, deeply uh, misogynistic, uh, militaristic uh, writings. And I also couldn't tell, is this is this mainstream evangelicalism or is this fringe? And if it is fringe, should I be shining a bright light on maybe the darkest underbelly of American Christianity? Um, So I just kind of bracketed it, set it aside. And it wasn't until the fall of 2016, uh, in the weeks after the Access Hollywood tape released, actually, 
that mm. I ended up pulling this research back out because what I was hearing around evangelical support for Donald Trump reminded me so much of the rhetoric that I had immersed myself in all those years ago in evangelical writing on Christian manhood. Well, can we take a step back and maybe define some terms here? You use, you know, masculinity and patri- toxic masculinity, patriarchy. I think these can be confusing terms because you said it's not particularly biblical, but I, I grew up very much in the world in which you were writing this book. And, and you know, for me, it did seem biblical because we had the masculine examples of King David and the way that it was positioned seemed quite biblical. So, maybe let's define some terms of what we mean by patriarchy or toxic masculinity. Sure. Well, I should say when, when it didn't seem all that biblical, what I noticed when I was reading books like Eldridge, and then there's a whole kind of copycat industry around that book because it had been so successful, was that most of the you know, quote unquote, evidence for this kind of militant Christian masculinity wasn't drawn from the Bible directly. Uh, it was drawn from Hollywood heroes, from Mel Gibson's William Wallace, from the movie Braveheart, from uh, <laughs> you know, movies with John mm-hmm. Wayne, uh, mythical warriors, soldiers, and the like, uh, with some Bible verses sprinkled here or there. Interesting, right? Okay. Um, but but yes, defining terms. So patriarchy is is pretty simple. It's really just you know male power, masculine power, um, where most power is given to men and restricted from women. Uh, So, it can take different shape in different um, historical periods. And yes, there's certainly a Christian patriarchy and a tradition of Christian patriarchy. And there are ways to interpret different Bible verses to support male leadership, male headship in the church, in the home, and in society. And there are ways to interpret those very same Bible verses that really undercut um, patriarchal leadership, as, as you well know. So, so there's, that's kind of patriarchy. Now, you mentioned toxic masculinity, which is a phrase that I don't actually use in this book, largely because I'm, I'm aware that that is a phrase that really resonates with certain people, particularly progressives, liberals, <laughs> and so on, know exactly what we're talking about. And I think it really can put off conservatives. It's, it's a very loaded term. So instead, hmm. I just describe things that actually could be described as toxic masculinity. And here, what we're talking about more is not just the idea of, you know, maybe more narrowly masculine authority or male headship in Christian circles, but all of the kind of cultural trappings that then get built into those patriarchal systems. So it's, you know, what is it? What is a man? How did God make men in all sorts of ways? So God made them not just to lead, but to be a kind of militant warrior leader. God filled men with testosterone, and so they have these these, um, impulses that are very hard to restrain, and that's what makes them so aggressive and and, and such good warriors to defend faith, family, and nation. It also Mm. entails ideas about sexuality, that men have a hard time restraining their sexual impulses. And so so there's all these kind of layers that get added onto male leadership attributes that are very quickly turned into, you know, all men are created this way or all men are this way, and that God designed men to be this way. And these are things that um, arguably can cause great harm to men themselves and uh, to women, to children, and, and really in terms of society and, and even international relations and so on. So they can have some really caustic effects. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, maybe not using the term toxic masculinity, but per- describing yeah. things. What are some of these examples? You've, you know, you've thrown out uh, William Wallace and, and Hollywood, and, but were there, are, these, are there certain cultural moments over the last several decades that you would point out that, that led people to identifying with this kind of Christianity or this kind of Christian manhood more than others? Well, can I ask too, Jared, just in the context, uh, can we go back before Teddy Roosevelt? Yeah. Or, or do you think that's sort of like a real Starting crystallizing point, yeah. moment, practically speaking? Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, in the book, I, I look back to the 19th century, just very briefly, more to disrupt any notion that, you know, this kind of um, more militant, rugged masculinity is just default masculinity or default Christian masculinity. Because if you look in the 19th century, you can find ideals of Christian manhood that are not this kind of rugged warrior ideal. Quite the opposite. To be a man is to to 
really master self-restraint, this gentlemanly self-restraint, right? That's this kind of Victorian Christian ideal of, of mature masculinity. Um, now, that said, you also have in the American South in particular, a more rugged model of white Christian patriarchy in particular, uh, which is linked to a kind of Southern culture of honor and to mastery over not just women and children, but also enslaved people. And so you, you see that, you know, history is complicated. You can find continuity mm-hmm. and change. And, and so you can find some kind of precursors, but you can also find patterns that disrupt um, more recent time. And I thought that was really important that things have not always been the way they are now. And then what I do in the book is I show how a particularly militant conception became combined with Christian nationalism, right? With this defense right, right. of Christian America. And then it's it's really, you can see that coming together to a certain extent in the early 20th century with Teddy Roosevelt and in the First World War. But even then, you had liberal Protestants who were as likely to embrace this kind of muscular Christianity and Christian nationalism. And you had conservative Protestants accepting uh, Billy Sunday, of course, but you had many conservative Protestants who resisted, uh, particularly Christian nationalism. And so it's not really Mm -hmm. till the Cold War era that things come together in a way we would recognize today. Uh, So the 1940s, 1950s, when we see conservative white evangelicals linking this defense of Christian America to gender traditionalism and the idea that the man must serve as provider and protector. And given the Cold War threat, this role of protector is is really important. And because it's a military threat, that role has to also be an aggressive military defense. And offense is usually the best defense. And so it's the Cold War era where this really does start to, to, to come together powerfully. You know, we have Billy Graham, the formation of the National Association of Evangelicals, and that's the era where, where things really come together. Yeah, I mean, what really struck me uh, in reading your wonderfully disturbing book, Jesus and John Wayne, was this Christian nationalism connection to toxic masculinity and uh, just the, the almost effortless weaving together of those things. And, you know, here we are. Um, you mentioned Billy Graham. Mm-hmm. And I, again, I think I'm thinking about people who may want to pick this book up and read it, and I hope they do. And, you know, there are some sacred cows that get tipped over in the book, and, uh, and, and for very good reason, I might add. Could you, uh, you mind riffing a little bit on, on Billy Graham's influence in this whole merger of Christian nationalism and, and masculinity? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> some responses I've gotten to this book is, uh, I, I've heard more than once, you know, you named names. And, you know, frankly, as a historian, well, I don't know obviously. how else to write. <laughs> um, but yes, Billy Graham is one who, who comes under some scrutiny. Um, but really nothing that historians haven't been saying for a long time. It's just that white evangelicals have tended to tell their own histories, their own versions of events. And in that version of events, or, uh, you know, Billy Graham is, is this, this kind of untouchable hero, all that is good in evangelicalism. And so I, I really did set out to disrupt that. One of my favorite pictures in the book is this young Billy Graham, and he's this dashingly handsome figure. And he he rose to fame and um, as a an evangelist in the Youth for Christ uh, ministry, and that was during the Second World War. And so he embraced this defense of America, of Christian America, and that was really at the center of his ministry. Ex- extremely patriotic. And then he ends up being the center of this this web that is evangelicalism, this web of institutions and popular media and you know magazines and radio and and um, he's he's really the hub, and he has this access to power, right? With the Eisenhower White House and um, a, a line of presidents um, following, and he's he's incredibly ambitious politically speaking. And he's also, as I show in the book, an ardent supporter of Cold War militarism, of American mm-hmm. militarism, of the, the war effort in Vietnam. And in so many ways, then, he kind of re- represents what white evangelicalism becomes. On civil rights, too, he has this reputation for you know, taking down the, the divider between black and white attendees at, at his crusades, which was true. 
But that's about as far as he went. And he certainly stepped back from a wholehearted uh, critique of segregationism and um, certainly stepped back from a full, full-throated support of Martin Luther King Jr. And so I just tell the story that is a familiar story to professional historians Um, But I frankly wasn't quite prepared for how shocking some of this history would be to white evangelical readers um, who who really had to had to think again about this figure that they'd really held in such high esteem and that they they thought, you know, he defines the best of evangelicalism. And if that's the best of evangelicalism, then we kind of have to rethink who we are and and what evangelicalism is as a tradition. I wanted to back up. We don't have to get too far into this, but I think it's important to note, again, for my upbringing, you know, I've been trying to rack my brain on this connection of nationalism and Christianity. And and for me, the theological connection, which was interesting, was both, we held both of these things very sacred and very true, Mm -hmm. that Israel continued to be God's chosen people, and we as a nation had to continue to defend Israel lest bad things happen to us as a nation, and we had sort of taken on Israel's identity. Yeah. Where there was this mix of, you know, I, going to liberty, where Jerry Falwell would quote Chronicles and basically, if you are my people, you mm-hmm. call me by my name, like, we, you know, this Show, healing of a nation. Like, the, there was this interesting relationship with Israel, I think is mm-hmm. what I'm trying to point out, mm-hmm. that allowed for this theological connection so that when I read my Bible and I see Israel having, as a country, as a nation, this special relationship with God, I'm able to substitute America. Yes. And that was really important for my identity growing up. And I, is that something that you've uncovered as well in this? Yeah, you know, I, I talk about Christian Zionism just um, a couple of times in this book, but I certainly could have done much more because because you're right. There's uh, this idea of supporting Israel, and um, and that's a defense of, of U.S. militarism as well, anything in defense of Israel. And, um, and at the same time, this kind of slippage into America as the new Israel, that is certainly present. Mm-hmm. And, and again, that, that America has this special role in the world, in world history. And what that looks like then is, is so in the 1950s, evangelical values, you know, Christian America and a defense of Christian America and also defense of the traditional family as, as, as the kind of foundation of the American social order. All of that was central to evangelical identity, but it was actually central to American identity in many ways, right? It didn't really set evangelicals apart from many other Americans, right. especially white middle-class Americans. This was the baby boom. This was, the, you know, yeah. um, Cold War consensus. When the rupture happens, this is the 1960s, and that's when these values that evangelicals held dear were abandoned by many other Americans. They start to doubt American goodness and greatness when they see what's happening on the battlefields of Vietnam. Oh, yeah. The civil rights movement challenges ideals of American greatness and goodness on the home front. The feminist movement is challenging you know, these quote-unquote traditional roles of women and men. And and that's when, when, just as many other Americans are questioning these values, that's when conservative evangelicals really double down. And they feel a sense of loss because in the in the fifties they were they were at the center of things they were moving into the center of things access to power, and all of a sudden they find themselves once again on the margins and they feel like they are a faithful remnant. So God has charged them with keeping America Christian, which was looking hard with all the hippies and anti war activists and so on, right? And keeping America strong at the same time. And so it was a sense of you know if not us who will who will do this? And so that is also part of this, this sense of yeah, loss. And keeping America strong is keeping the church strong. It's keeping the Christian faith. Exactly. Right? The, that's Keeping the, the faith strong and raising your boys yes. to be strong men. Well, going back to that then, maybe can you say a little bit of the difference between masculinity and, and toxic masculinity? And maybe, maybe we can even, not to pick on John Wayne, but he's in the title of your... <laughs> yeah. Of your book, There's like probably how a does reason for that. how does John Wayne represent you know a healthy masculinity and a, a toxic? I it, I just think it'd be a, a helpful dis- yeah. 
distinction. Concrete mm-hmm. here, right. Yeah. Sure. So masculinity is is really quite generic. It's whatever uh, people in any given time think uh, ascribes to you know being a man. Whatever goes along with being a man. So it's a very fluid concept. It changes quite a bit over time. Here again, you can find some continuities if you're looking for them, but there's a lot of change over time as well. But it's essentially in any given moment what anybody deems masculine, right? Whatever goes along with being a man. And so it's it's kind of this this empty container into which you can put things in and, and remove things. So some of these things can be very good things, like honor and um, honesty and courage. And you know you can put a lot of virtues, or as I said before, self restraint. Now, when when things move in the more toxic direction, I think that's when uh, these attributes start getting defined in a sense in opposition to as opposite from whatever gets in the femininity mm-hmm. box, okay. right? And and that's when things get really dicey. Um, and that's exactly what we see happening in the Christian literature here. You know, folks like, like James Dobson back in the 70s already will say that you know, men and women are different in every cell of their bodies, which, you know, biologically you can make that case. Um, but then the again the kind of cultural layers that get added to that, what that ends up looking like is attributes that are considered masculine are opposite of those considered feminine. So so let's take, for example, the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I mean, you know where this is going. These are all the feminine yeah. traits. These are great for the ladies. That's only in the women's Bible. Exactly. The one with pink flowers on it. Yeah. Right. And and so so then men, um, you know, what is it to be a man? And testosterone is key. And so testosterone is God's gift to men and to society through men. And in the, um, the fruit of that is aggression and violence which can be channeled, must be channeled for this greater good. But violence is key to masculinity, to being a man. And it's about power. And it's about claiming power and grasping power and holding power. And so, uh, you know, this is, as I said before, you know, it didn't, uh, when I first was reading this, didn't feel particularly biblical because Mm -hmm. as I read the scriptures, and look at the model of Christ, it seems like, you know, to me, Christ is is someone who divests himself of power. And that's not what we see happening in terms of this, quote-unquote, biblical manhood or Christian masculinity, where it's about claiming power over others and claiming that that's God's will. Well, even, even mundane things such as, I just remember my parents going to counseling and one of the main takeaways was the reason your marriage is struggling is because my mom, who had been a banker for 20 years, does the finances. That's yes. why. Well, if, you're, <laughs> if if my dad would just yes. take, my dad, who's been a truck driver for 20 years, would just take over the <laughs> yeah. finances, you'd be better. And it's like exactly. seemingly so mundane and it was such a train wreck. <laughs> exactly. There are so, there's so much within the, this cultural baggage that gets you know, kind of baptized as, you know, biblical manhood or biblical womanhood, and it affects sexuality and, and, and sexual morality and power dynamics. Um, but you asked about John Wayne, right? So, I did not set out to write a book about John Wayne, full disclosure. <laughs> um, but what I what I saw, again, is that um, so, so much of the inspiration for ideals of Christian manhood were drawn from popular culture, mm-hmm. not from deep biblical right. exegesis. Mm-hmm. So, if we take somebody like John Wayne, you know, you can find some good attributes if you look at certain John Wayne movies, um, perhaps, but what really elevated him to cult status in American history, so that for decades, up until very recently, he was America's number one most favorite actor, (laughs) until just a few years ago. And if you look at his heroism, this is where I started to notice that, that we had to talk not just about Christian masculinity, but about white Christian masculinity. Because I noticed that all of the heroes that these Christian writers were were holding up were white men, some of them Confederate generals even. And then John Wayne is a, is a great case in point where all of his kind of greatest hits on screen, he was the, the heroic white man who would use violence as necessary to subdue, in most cases, non-white populations. So the Wild West. You know the cowboy hero subduing Native Americans, or else defeating Mexicans in the you know at the Alamo or or um, or trying to 
or you know, on the uh, the sands of Iwo Jima uh, against Japanese or the Green Berets, Vietnamese, and so it's this this white masculine power, the need to use violence as necessary to pursue righteousness and achieve order, and um, and that fits very closely, maps very closely onto both the kind of social and political implications of this Christian militant masculinity that I was tracing in the popular literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, you've been living with this topic now for maybe two decades. Is that fair to say? Just about now, off and on. Yes. So in all, I mean, in your research, is, is there anything that's just surprised you? I mean, just like, I can't believe I'm reading this or, (laughs) Or maybe something that really irked you, you know, and, and going through these things and just looking at this relatively recent history in American mm-hmm. culture. Yeah, um, many things, honestly. <laughs> I did not know what I was embarking on. Is this part two of our podcast? <laughs> we need more time. <laughs> right, right. Uh, like, yeah. uh, you know, one was one of the things that shocked me. Well, first, let me step back and say, you know, I, I set this research aside for, for more than a decade. But I didn't stop paying attention. I kind of kept tabs on some of the leading proponents of this militant Christian manhood. And what I saw is one after another in, in the course of the decade became implicated in, in scandals, uh, abuse mm, of power, right. and often sexual abuse, either directly or indirectly supporting friends um, who were perpetrators. And, um, and so I, I paid attention to that. And uh, when I went back into the history I was shocked at how we should have expected this, at how these ideals of masculinity and femininity mapped onto uh, kind of sex adv- advice. I read a lot of Christian sex advice manuals from the 60s and 70s up to the present. As we all do. Yeah. As, mm-hmm. we, all, mm-hmm. as we all should not do. <laughs> right. um, and what I found there was incredibly disturbing, you know, uh, really that blame women for abuse um, it's a woman's fault if uh, because uh, it, men, again, testosterone, you can't really expect them to, to restrain themselves, not very much at least. So if you're an unmarried woman, you absolutely cannot tempt a, a man. And if you are a married woman, it is absolutely your obligation to fulfill your husband's every sexual need. And so if he ends up being an abuser, even of a child, um, clearly you aren't meeting his needs. It was that blatant and mm-hmm. that shocking mm-hmm. over and over again. That would be one of the things. All in the interest of keeping the system intact. Yes, yes, yeah. right. So always always look at power, right? Who's wielding power and to what ends. Um, and then the other thing I was not prepared for that I kept bumping up against in this research that is, I think, relevant in where we are today was the question of authority. Just how important, you know, authority or, if you will, power was um, going back to the 60s, the 70s, this this sense of we need to reassert authority over culture, over young people, over children, over women. And um, as I was reading this, it, it, it kept striking me that this is... This is really um, leaning towards authoritarianism. This is an- deeply anti-democratic, and I wasn't sure what to do mm. with that. But I just wrote it into the the, the history, wrote it into the, the narrative I was telling, and and really only in recent years have I have I had to kind of grapple with the implications of this in terms of the resiliency of American democracy, our democratic institutions and norms. I mean. I don't want to. I don't want to go down this tangent. I think there is, though, some important. You clearly, do I do? I do. <laughs> when I say I don't, I mean I really do. <laughs> but I just can't help but think, though, if we're taking, you know, what what do we do with the Bible in the midst of all this? Because I think there's some yeah. challenges within that. Just you bringing up democracy, I'm like, well, the, the Bible doesn't have democracy in it. There isn't. There isn't a right. lot of democracy being advocated for here, um, mm-hmm. in so, in a lot of ways. And so, there, you know. I guess I'm trying to figure out what what went wrong over the last 50 to 70 years that we had this Bible that Christians for a long time have sort of staked their faith on and said this is really important, it's central to our faith, and yet you mentioned there's something particular in the last 50 to 70 years, 100 years, that that went awry. It, it, was it, you know, I'm speculating because I genuinely am just processing out loud, but is there something about having this consciousness of war and there's a lot of fear mm-hmm. now around yeah. it? Um, we have we now have video, we have pictures, you know, Viet- Vietnam War where we can see it on our nightly TV screens. 
is there a fear that had led to this overcompensation where we have to somehow justify violence so that we don't feel so afraid? I'm I'm just trying to yeah. figure out where this came from. I love this question. So did did fear kind of lead to this violence? That was absolutely my my operating theory when I started this research. Uh, and that was honestly, if you look at you know conversations around the the 2016 election and explaining white evangelical support for Trump, it was really the narrative of evangelicals were largely holding their noses um, and and they were just desperate. They were just so afraid to protect their religious liberty to you know to kind of um, protect their very existence. And so any extreme actions were the response of fear. That was my kind of working theory. And then when I went back into the history, I realized that at a certain point, we needed to flip that script. And now, if you go back into huh. the Cold War era, you know, sure, um, you can see that there, there was a lot of fear. Um, but then one of the questions I started asking was, who is stoking that fear? And what I saw is over and over again, which isn't to say there, there weren't legitimate fears in, in, you know, during the era of the Cold War, <laughs> but there's an active stoking of that fear, both by the government and by religious leaders in the early Cold War era, throughout the Cold War. And then I started looking at specific examples. I started looking at things like uh, Jerry Falwell Sr.'s ministry and uh, Mark Driscoll's church. And even the, these crazy stories of the, um, the fraudulent ex-Muslim terrorists that were all the right. rage after September 11, right? And what I saw in each case is that the fears were real. The fears of ordinary evangelicals were very real. So, so somebody like um, uh, Falwell would, would, would really incite fear in, in, his, um, in the members of Thomas Road Baptist Church, those who followed his ministry, that, you know, we have the truth here, and you cannot trust those on the outside. If they are not with us, they are against us, this kind of militant worldview, us versus them. Which is kind of like a cult leader's MO, right? It is, and it's also like, it's war. It's war, right? In, in mm-hmm, war, if you're mm-hmm. not with us, you're mm-hmm. against us. And desperate times call for desperate measures. This is even clearer in Mark Driscoll's case, where, you know, he used this kind of war motif, the explicitly militaristic um, conception of his, his ministry, to demand absolute loyalty of his followers. Because in war, you demand loyalty. Otherwise, you're a traitor. Right. And so, and, and so he stoked fear actively. You know, he had, he was flanked by security guards in the sanctuary as he was preaching to, <laughs> to build this sense of, and you know, don't go to that church down the road because you're going to get false teaching and, and, and the, <sighs> the consequences of this are eternal damnation. And, and so the, again, the fear was real in the hearts of followers, but it was actively stoked by religious leaders by evangelical men, for what purposes? In almost every case, to consolidate their own power. And that's how this worked. And so, I I was able to both hold fears are legitimate, and they are also manufactured. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, capitalizing on fear, which, uh, you know, many people have described uh, the Donald Trump era that way, too. Yes. Right. There are some fears that people have, but these are fears are being stoked. I think, you know, for me, one of the big takeaways, uh, Kristen, is a- along with Christian nationalism is the, the, the simple observation that you're, you're answering a question people have asked. How could evangelicals vote for Donald Trump? Yeah. Well, here's why. <laughs> this, I mean, because this is a very old problem. I mean, not hundreds of years old, but it's, it's decades in the making, and it's, it's not that – this is something that the evangelical system that's aligned with politics, this is something they've created, mm-hmm. right? Right. That's a scary thought to me. It's a very – that's not scary. It's just disturbing and infuriating and even maddening yeah. that this has happened and people just don't see it. And I just don't know why uh, – I don't know. What am I talking about? I mean, wh- why do people see anything? It just – it seems rather obvious to me that – you can't it's really hard to mix the gospel with this kind of christian nationalism yes. and and you said you know they they might appeal to bible verses taken out of context mm-hmm. whatever but you know the ethic of jesus is such and such but they take care of that too yeah they have posters of jesus yes. who's ripped carrying an ak47 and like a bandana you know and yeah. he and and jesus wants you to fight and kill people exactly exactly this is the corrupted the faith part of my subtitle right it's what I noticed is, you know, in the case of Donald Trump, in the case of John Wayne, 
uh, the, the, the heroes that they looked to, the, the warriors that would lead the charge, were not coincidentally men who were not actually formed by Christian virtue, right? Mm. Because they could come in and they could do what needed to be done. They would not be constrained by traditional Christian virtue at all. So they were paradoxically the most fit to protect Christianity. And again, the, the best defense is, is an aggressive offense. And that's why right. we have to see Trump in many ways, not as a betrayal of evangelical values, but as the fulfillment of those values. Right. That answer is a very basic question that people have asked. Again, how – look at all the stuff that Donald Trump has done. How can Christians support him? Again, here's the answer. Yeah. Because he's an outsider who can get away with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yeah, and they have to change Jesus then, right? Because if we're supposed to be followers of Christ, who is your Jesus? Right. And so they, they right. do transform Jesus into this, you know, a, a warrior leading, you know, wielding a bloody sword, charging into battle on horseback with tattoos down his leg. That's that's Driscoll's Jesus. Yeah, it is. And uh, it just I, reminds me, I don't, I was trying to look up the quote, but I think Jerry Falwell Jr., toward the end of Trump's presidency, basically m- kind of made that point yeah. of we you know well yeah we sure maybe we it's not but i'm not voting for him because he's a christian like i'm voting him right. for him for these other reasons i'm and, supporting him for these other reasons and then you have the cyrus thing you know yeah. here we have a secular messiah essentially yeah. you know uh from isaiah and and all these things you know you can find biblical support of course for yes. anything you can find biblical support but there they have it you know and and uh and I just, you know, what's what's stoking that? What's what's the motivation? You know, what I'm asking rhetorically now. It's just there's it's it's a very complicated issue, mm-hmm. and getting out of it is going to be even harder. <laughs> well, that yeah, let's let's go there because I I think I want to make sure we have time to talk a little bit about this. You know, the saying, "Those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it." So you you've done the historical yeah, research. Yeah, fix this, Kristen. What, <laughs> how what do, do we, we do? <laughs> how do we steps? not repeat it? Like, what are some steps we can take to wrest Christianity from this ideology, or can can we? I mean, we're always in some ways we go from one system to the next. We can't delude ourselves into thinking we can be systemless. But yeah. are there steps that we can take here? So you know, early on when I started writing this book in earnest, I thought you know I, I can change things. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna hold this up, and it's it's gonna change. It's gonna change things, and it's gonna reform um, Christianity. And then. Just a few months into the research, I, I gave that up. I saw just how deeply embedded this all was. And then I just decided, mm-hmm. I'm just I'm going to testify to this. That's all I can do. And then I got to the end of the manuscript, preparing it for publication. And at a certain point, late in the game, my editor emailed me and said, so this is a really depressing book, Kristen. <laughs> and you can't leave your readers here. You need to give them something. And so I, I, I gave it some real thought, and, and I, I responded to him, I've got nothing. I feel as depressed as you do. <laughs> Jesus is coming back right? real soon. I mean, it, uh, it's, <laughs> Maybe that's... It's, it's not looking good, is what I said. <laughs> and then he, he said, okay, I respect that. And then about two days later, another email, Kristen, just give us something. And so that's when I went back, and, and I gave him the last sentence of the book. Which is <laughs> right. <That's good. laughs> what was once done fine, exactly fine. as I, what was once done might also be undone. And honestly, I felt so sheepish sending that to him. I'm like, it is not enough. And he's like, fine, I'll take it. <laughs> and, and the book went yeah, into into right. publication, right? And and then uh, honestly, in since the book has has been out, it's been out almost a year now, and. I, I'm holding to that because so many readers are holding to that phrase. There are so many readers who uh, have, I mean, I re, I've received so many hundreds of letters from evangelicals themselves, several a day, still to this day, saying, this is a story of my life, and I had no idea. And, you know, I think that history can help explain how their own personal stories are part of this larger story and how they have, in fact, wittingly or unwittingly been complicit in in bringing us to where we are now. And so I'm I'm hearing a lot of energy around the this question what do we do next? How do we undo this? First ultra important step is is to see where we are and how we got here, right? Uh, because because if we see that things have not always been this way, then we can we can figure out okay, who made these choices? Because choices were made and to what ends? And again, it's it's usually to enhance somebody's own power. And then we can start to say is this 
where we want to be as a church? Is this where we want to be as God's people? And that's a critical first step. So I'm a huge fan of history and what it can do to open up these questions. Um, but then beyond that, this is where things get a little sketchier for me because my expertise is as a historian, uh, not advising church leaders. But I think that uh, one of the lessons that I learned from this research is you know, how, how many of us have been complicit through silence through choosing what is safe, what is least disruptive in institutions, in churches, in families, in friend groups of not speaking truth, because that might come with a cost. And yeah. millions of those choices over decades of time really have brought us to where we are now. So I think what, what the moment calls for right now is rigorous honesty of our own motivations. Uh, for white Christians in particular, uh, what is needed is to listen to the voices of non-white Christians, <laughs> mm -hmm. to listen to those who have been excluded from their company, from you know their conceptions of of truth and uh, their communities. And I think that's a really good place to start. There are you know vibrant traditions of prophetic Christianity on which we can all draw. Um, so I think that's a critical step. And really, what's needed is is courage in this moment, individually. And collectively, mm -hmm. I think that's a great word for us to, yeah, to end on. Absolutely. And um, yeah. really appreciate you spelling this out, not just here in the podcast, but again in the book, uh, where you go into uh, more detail and completely describe my childhood. So um, appreciated that in some ways, and, and also hated you too. for it. There are pictures, too. <laughs> so, which is yeah, yeah, poor. I mean, I don't read books, about pictures, <laughs> so it worked out. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kristen, for coming on. Oh, thank you. It was it was a joy. All right, everyone, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening and supporting our show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We want to give a big shout out to our producers group. Who support us over on Patreon. They are the reason we're able to keep bringing podcasts and other content to you. So big thanks to Andy Capone, Olumuyua Oluwasumi, Casey Hatcher, Dorsey Marshall, Scott Goldman, Jess Brand, Joel Herring, Laura Grant, Matthew P. Henry, Philip Gibson, and Kyle Miller. If you would like to help support the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash the Bible for normal people, where for as little as $3 a month, you can receive bonus material, be part of an online community, get course discounts, and much more. We couldn't do what we do without your support. Thanks as always to our team, producer Stephanie Spate, audio engineer Dave Gerhardt, creative director Tessa Stoltz, community champion Ashley Ward, and web developer Nick Striegel. For Pete, Jared, and the entire Bible for Normal People team, thanks for listening. <laughs>